we're unconsciously bringing content that's unresolved, unconsciously bringing a place in us that we can't hold ourselves. Uh, sometimes, so like that's what's coming to you mm -hmm. every day. And then the different responses to that initial holding of something that hasn't been held. Cause it seems like that could really vary. Yes. Is it kind of like a, it could be shock, fear, disgust, shame, confusion. Yeah. And often what is the case is the thing we need to be felt. So, some, sometimes we're very willing to share it with the other person, but a lot of times the, the deeper thing that we really need to have felt, we're terrified and or ashamed to have the other person actually see it and feel it. Right. And we stay fixated on this other thing. You know, it's like if I really need this deep shame in me and this awful experience of, that I'm really disgusting and, you know, there's something wrong with me. It's like, really, I need, the truth is I need you to feel that with me. But, for example, I might be stuck in, no, I just have murderous rage and I need you to see that and feel that. Mm. And you can be on 10 years into that going, Lance, I feel the murderous rage that you have, you know, very clearly. Yeah, yeah. But there's something beneath that. And the person yeah. will just kind of keep going back to that, that defensive feeling. Hmm. And, or, or it can be vice versa. They just keep being in this shameful, I'm a bad person, I'm whatever. And it's like, no. Or yes, but it's like, <laughs> yes, that feeling's there. You're having that yeah, experience. But right. there's a deeper experience that you're actually defending against. Hmm. So it's very difficult, very confusing and, and and of course you dip beneath the the cognitive rational right and and then it really because there's like, no there's no source for it or there's no like narrative behind how or at least on, on the surface that behind how those feelings layered on top of each other right right and so to get back to something that caused the primary defense like you're saying is is irrational yes and it's very, very hard for, for people in general to shift out of the rational yeah. and allow the irrational. And Well, it has to be a break of some kind. Yeah, and it, often that's what it takes. But, but this thing where Freud, you know, Freud's technique was free association. And the idea was, let's set up an environment where you just start freely associating and a bunch of irrational stuff's going to surface. Mm. Right. That was the idea. It was it was a it was a technique that was designed to try to get at that part of the psyche. And then Jung, his technique was active imagination, and there was there was differences in in active imagination versus free association. But the general idea was the same with regard to what we want to do is is get you into an activated state and then stay in that activated state and let content from that activated state surface as opposed to immediately invalidating that experience mm. because it's, you know, cause you're just activated. You're just triggered or, or that's nonsensical or that that's inaccurate. It's like, let it keep going. Mm. You know, that, that idea of like, Oh, that was just a dream. It's like, yeah, but you can analyze the dream, right? This whole, it, again, that's a big paradigm mm. shift. To say there's validity, right? There's there's to something content, yeah. yeah, there's something to be learned in the irrational experience. Just like with art, it's like, you know, abstract art. It's like, well, you know, don't just poo poo it because it's not linear rational. Formal, yeah. What's the symbolic meaning in there, for example? But so again, that's all fine conceptually, but it's one thing to look at a dolly painting and and not just go, ah, oh, it's all warped. You know, it's there's something wrong with it. It's like, no, there's he did that on purpose, you know. But it's like when you go into the surreal, the direct surreal experience in your own head, right? It's like that's the imaginal. The imaginal is surreal. Yeah. And can you tolerate that and allow yourself to look at that in the moment?
instead of just desperately try to get back to a cognitive, linear, rational experience where you feel sane and you feel valid and you feel justified and you feel correct. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, you're not uh, trying to prove something to someone else. Yeah. Trying to build a case for what your experience is and how you would explain it. Yeah. So that's another big paradigm shift is, okay, you know, some people are understand that and go into, it doesn't mean it's easy, but they understand, okay, I'm going to go do a therapy session. And the goal here is for me to dive into my, my irrational unconscious stuff as opposed to, as opposed to just get justification for where I'm right. Mm. Right. Or, Or find some fix or like, like they're two very different goals. And they both, they both have their place. There's a place for validation. There's a place for figuring out, analyzing, uh, getting support, getting positive feedback. But depth psychotherapy, for example, it, that's not what that is. Yeah. And then, it, again, this thing that people don't understand, that it's like, if you broke your nose... The experience of healing that broken nose, meaning energetically and therefore fascially and, and as far as your nervous system and all that, your mind has to face the experience of your, and, and I'm saying this because I've had my nose broken and I, uh, I, I've probably said this before in the podcast, but it's like I, I had my, my nose rolfed a zillion times. I, I worked with it in this way and that just struggled, struggled energetically. Once I started to be able to feel chakras, I spent countless hours, you know, wrestling with the energetics in my nose and could just still tell there was just this tension and, you know, stuff that affected my whole body. And then there was this shift where I went to a different level with regard to how I was orienting and anchoring and identifying. And was able to become aware of a part of my mind that was faced with the experience of my, like my face is being demolished or my face is being disfigured, you know, and, and I'm, and this is either going to, I'm either going to die and, or my, like my, you know what I mean? Like the experience in the moment that the, that the psyche is going to, be up against is like this is this is catastrophic everything from i'm going to be mangled and disfigured to i'm going to die and the and the mind sit with that and, and of course i couldn't just stay present with that as the fist was contacting my face and pushing my nose to the side of my head <laughs> you know no. it's like in that split second my psyche said see you later yeah and I remember a, a certain time it happened. You know, my nose, my nose was literally pushed over about an inch. And blood was running down the, the front of my face and shirt to where my shirt was blood soaked. And I was still in the midst. Of, I didn't even know it happened. Mm. And someone after the incident, I was so jacked up, you know, and, and then someone said, dude, like, you got to go look in the mirror. Your, your nose is broken. Bad. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I reached up and touched my nose and had this searing pain suddenly (laughs) and went and looked in the mirror. But it was like, that's the, you know, the level to which we can split is is kind of incredible. And then my point is, 20 years later, I was still split and didn't know it. Mm. You know, I went in that incident, I went to the hospital, to the ER, and they said, we can't set that. You got to get plastic surgery. Mm. I had to go get plastic surgery. I went under anesthesia, full anesthesia, you know, woke up with a cast over my nose and, uh, and then, it, you know, it healed. And then it's like, okay, I'm all good. But 20 yeah. years later, I came to realize actually I have sinus trouble and neck tension and some low back stuff going on. And I can't quite engage my core the way I used to. And I can't quite smell my food as well. Mm. And, when something kind of gets near my face, I'll, I'll, I'm, I feel kind of jumpy in a way that someone's like, yeah. I'm not even close to your face. And it's like, yes, you were. And, you know, and, 
It's like there's yeah. a long list of symptoms. And again, so I wrestled with it, wrestled with it. But the fix was then I finally was able to bring my conscious attention back into the part of my mind that I couldn't tolerate when I was, and this is the, the big point, identifying even just that, let alone orienting my attention from my nose or, or from the part of my mind that's like was aware of, you know, my face and nose and just tolerating, oh, well, I'm going to accept this experience that my face is being mangled. It was like, it was just too much, you know, I couldn't do it. But when I mm -hmm. could step outside and orient my attention from conscious awareness and look back at the part of my mind that was faced with death and disfigurement, it felt awful. But, I, but when I could stay anchored in consciousness, I actually could allow it to process through. Mm. And, when, and, and when I did, I could feel it right away. As soon as I hit that part of my mind with my conscious attention, and saw it and felt it, right? Because initially I witnessed it. And it was like, oh shit, that, you know, I was seeing a place in my psyche that I just hadn't seen. Yeah. But I suddenly was witnessing it. And then it was like, oh, I got to hold that. And then at first it was like, I could feel the pull, it, like this magnetic pull. I wanted to go back into my mind and then leave that part of my mind and go in, out into my nose and just contract like crazy to put a fucking stop to that huh. whole experience. Yeah, And it was like, okay, wait, wait, come back out, come back out, witness that part of my mind. Okay, yep, that part of my mind just, just is like in this state of like this terrible experience. But I was like, okay, just hold it, hold it. All right, I could feel the energy start to move. It was like, oh my God, my nose started to kind of, it, it crackled a couple times and I felt some tension release that I hadn't felt, you know, in 20 years. Hmm. And I suddenly felt kind of down through my spine a certain kind of relaxing. And that was a, one of the big moments for me of, oh, this is, you know, not only am I getting some change in my own system, but it was like, oh, I'm getting a better understanding of how all this shit works. Right. And so it's like, oh, now the client that's laying on the table who broke their leg or, or who got, you know, terribly rejected or who got sexually abused or who, it's like, oh, they got to they gotta bring their consciousness back to the part of their psyche that, ex that, that was overwhelmed that made them split in the first place. We can't just work from these other levels without addressing that part. Which again, just became work on an entirely different level. Because we yeah. can talk about it forever. I could talk to you about, and then I was in this fight, and then my nose got broken. And, well, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, it's like to get at the, the, the actual experience in the psyche of experiencing what seems like certain death or what seems like permanent disfigurement or what seems like, like yeah. it's a tall order to try to jump in and experience it from there. You got You got to be aware of it, not from it or as it same with when I broke my arm, I, you know, I worked with my arm, worked with my arm and I finally went back into, no, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta engage the part of my mind that experienced, Oh my God, my arm's going to be, I'm losing my arm or I'm those deeper layers of the mind. They don't have the, the perspective to say, well, shit, my arm's broken, but I can go get it casted and it's going to be okay. That certain part of the mind just thinks it's over. It just is primal. There's a way you described it. You hadn't described it before that really resonated for me where you said the part of your psyche that saw that experienced the break as disfigurement. Yep. So the part of the psyche that felt the face as self. Because that's not, like you're saying, that's not the part of the psyche or the part of the mind that needs to deal with it after the fact. And then becoming aware of that part, but not as it or from it, and bringing conscious awareness to the part of the psyche that's aware of the face uh, there, there's just there's there's some steps there you spelled out I hadn't heard you spell out before. Okay. Yes, and and we can split off from any one of those steps, yeah. and it's crucial to figure out which one, because you can mm. spend years and years and years working with a step that isn't really the problem. It's not the mm. problem step. Yeah. The same broken nose. Different people are going to split from different 
steps. It's just, as you were saying it, like I felt my face in a different way. Okay. So it brought attention to some part of like my psyche that I hadn't really noticed before yeah, yeah. that could like have the face as it <laughs> could have the face as a sense of, it's not even a sense of self. It's, it's a, uh, the, the face as an object that's self-contained, like the, the, that dimension of the physical experience I hadn't really located before. Nice. That you were talking about. Right. Because the, the other things like you're saying, getting stuck in a different step of that, it's like uh, forced or maintained isolation of that experience or of that physical part of self. Yes, well put. There's one thing that you brought up recently when we were doing some work on my hand where you said you just need to let that be itself for a while. It's like stop trying to go in and identify as the hand or right. don't go in and like let your hand lead you around, around life. And it's like there's a certain healthy segmentation. So don't bring some part of the psyche to like bringing another dimension to that dimension isn't helping. Yeah. You've got to find the dimension that relates to that as itself. Yeah. Yeah. Not as self, but as that part of you. Right. And then do you see what I'm saying? Okay. That's like the computer analogy of which window are we talking about? Don't, don't open the wrong window. Right. Cause we're, you're not going to get the problem fixed if you're not in the right window. Right. There's also like, I just thought about like a parallax video error where you have like cascading images of the self because there's a feedback <laughs> right, loop right. between the camera and the, so let's say you look at a camera of the zoom screen instead of the zoom screen itself, you're going to see a hundred different instances yes. and none of them are really what's going on. Yeah. That's a great analogy. There was a thing we did. We were talking after a session while I was back and there was like a receiving thing mm -hmm. that I did. And you're like, that's, it feels like I was receiving you. Mm -hmm. And so I've been trying to do that more. And the, I wanted to know like, where does that fit within like witnessing, holding, containing, mirroring and contact? Typically the receiving is, is the holding cause, cause the receiving is the empathizing. Okay. However, it gets more nuanced because you can receive, but not be, you can be taking data in, but not, I'm just going to use computer analogy and let's say not downloading it. So, yep. so you can be hearing me, but just kind of letting it go right through. Right. And it's like, oh, you're receiving me. It's like, yeah, but it's not landing. Yeah. It's like, well, that's not like receiving is really being a receiver that it's landing on, not just not just an empty vessel that I'm. Yep. I get that. Yeah. And so that's an important thing to actually, but to, but to receive it and have it land it, well, that's, that takes some work on your end. Like that's, that's right. a higher. I have to acknowledge the part of me at impacts. It, yeah. Well put, well put. And, and that's part of that thing. When I say we want to be felt, we want to, we want what we're feeling to fucking impact somebody. It's mm. just this human need. And it sucks okay, when it's yeah. like, I feel murderous rage. And so, Jeff, I want you to <laughs> be impacted by my murderous rage. And it's yeah. like, well, shit, that's, you know, that's a, it's a tall order. Yeah. How do you balance the part of yourself that knows that it's within them and within you and you don't want to feel it right now, but like, how do you acknowledge it enough to not, yeah, yeah. pull out your phone and yell into it? <laughs> right. In the context of receiving like content from someone else, we, you talked about you can either just let it pass through you, just like not really feel it in yourself, or you can let it land and impact you. And that kind of letting it resonate like that is, is what empathy is. Is that another way to say that kind of bringing that first person felt experience into that dynamic? The thing that would feel that, the thing that would be impacted by it, is that the the first person experience of whatever that content is. You can look at content from the third person perspective and then bring personality into it. And I, I, th I feel like I might be mixing terms, but that's what I'm trying to ask to distinguish kind of some of these ideas. Like the, the experience of bringing 
personality into like looking at content as a way in which I feel the impact of what that content is versus just looking at it from the third person perspective. It, it, I, I think empathy can happen. I, I don't think empathy. I think you can feel empathy without the personality piece, but okay. you're, but you're just going to, you're going to, I mean, that's kind of the, the important part of it that when, like a lot of times when I'm working, I go into a fairly non-personal state you know, depending on how intense the experience is or how much I can relate, it's, it's like, okay, I can hold space and I can allow empathy, meaning I can allow myself to feel the vibrations, feel the energy that the other person is expressing. But it's the very act of, of going in, of taking my personality offline, if you will, that allows me to tolerate certain vibrations that if I, that if I bring that that part of my mind in that would, that would identify that then I'd, then I'd be overwhelmed just like they are. And it's the idea of putting, putting yourself in, in their shoes or, or pla placing your, this idea of your self in that situation, right? It's a really powerful thing. You take a ride. If you identify, you take a ride that you don't take if you don't identify. Whether you're watching a movie or listening to someone talk about something, you either put yourself in, the, in that position and then take the ride, or you, or you don't. And I think it's a, it's a powerful thing to become aware of doing that or not doing that, because people can be stuck taking rides that they wish they weren't taking. Is the degree to which, does the degree to which you're able to recognize how you identify with it, like let's say you bring the part of you that is impacted by it, does that expand your ability to tolerate it? Or is it just, depending on the content, just overwhelming and not productive for either one of you? To, to bring the personality online? Well, you, you said it wasn't even necessarily personality it could just be whatever like where wherever wherever they're expressing from the, the thing that's overwhelmed if you show up as the part of you that's overwhelmed is that just unhelpful i mean it, it you know it could be it can be helpful to show the other person can be validating to the other person okay if a surgeon needs to go into a mode where they're not in that part of their mind where they're thinking, oh my God, this person might die. What if I fuck up? You know, what's this yeah. person's story? Look, their family's waiting out in the other room. It's like, you know, they need to block all that out and just go into a go mode, right? Yeah. And it's not about blocking out though. So it's, a, it's, it's this tricky yeah. distinction because it's like, how do you let yourself feel something but take the ego mind personhood out. And in general, it's this, it's this idea of sacrifice. It's the, the, of death. You know, you, the place in the mind that, that monitors yourself and, and the preservation of self, whatever you think self is at any given moment, the experience of surrendering that and whether that means surrendering a, a position in three-dimensional space, whether that means surrendering a, a stance you were taking mentally. We try to hold these positions in your physical body. If something, if you put your hand on uh, something that's too hot, do you just, do you just <laughs> stay there and try to defeat the hot thing somehow? Or do you surrender the position and pull your hand away, right? And right. there's always this back and forth like that. And the ego mind, th there's that place in the mind that, that is constantly taking a position, you know, and it should. But then the question is, okay, do you fight to maintain that position or do you, or do you surrender it? Do you back off? Like if you feel like there's, there's nowhere to back up to, then you just come with primal rage. Because that's just what's in there. If you're, if you're backed into a corner... 
and you fit and you your experience is that there's no way no further backing up or surrendering or whatever that can happen then you just have to go forward in this in this uh desperate attempt to save yourself and the process of awakening is that you you get backed into that corner you hit that primal rage and for example it, you can be in a certain situation where, okay, then you express that primal rage and you express it and you do whatever you can to fight and you, and you at some point become aware that, that that's futile. You don't get the situation changed. It just, it, the situation is still what it is despite your absolute deepest, you know, rageful attempt to fight it. It's like, well, then what, right? Then, then you, you're faced with, defeat and you're faced with a collapse you're faced with insanity you're faced with death and you either kill yourself or you go crazy or you go through both those things death and madness and then what is there to be discovered is wait there, there's there's something beneath that there's this space ben beneath or, or after that behind that so what you thought was was uh you know a corner that couldn't be you couldn't back up any further. It's like, no, there's actually a space back there. Nice. And it, and that's the inner self, the conscious inner realm, which when you, when you discover that it's like you find a, a door in that corner and you go into it, but it initially, it seems like going into a, an even smaller space. But then what you discover is that, is that it's actually a door out of, let's say, the, the room that you were in, and you become aware outside the room. And now, now that room is something in your awareness versus you being something in that room. So it, it completely reverses. So the, the corner that you're stuck in, right, yeah. that you're trying to figure out how to react to, which is another word for that, uh, dimension, yeah. So this this because this cycle you're talking about of being backed into a corner and facing death is the is the same cycle we're taught we've been talking about as far as dimensions of experience and feeling death around that because of it being a spot where you you don't realize your identification with it. And then that that process finding new corners, a self behind beneath uh, after after that death, it's why you call it the the process of awakening. That there is, I think, experiences can seem like awakening itself, but they're really part of a process because it is a series of rooms, a series of dimensions. Not, not series isn't the right word, but a multitude of dimensions that this process uh, overtakes. Tell me if this resonates with what you're saying. You can be in a situation where your attention is in a mode where you're, you're being an identity in a dimension, or you can shift into a mode where you're, you're aware of a dimension, and now you're an identity that's outside the dimension, right? That's looking in it. But that's not necessarily awakening. Like there's the word actualization. The, the way I understand that term it, uh, or the way I use it is it, that's becoming aware of something, right? Realization is becoming aware as. So if you, if you get liberated from a dimension, right, you were, in, you were an identity in it, and then you shift to where you're aware of it, the question is, okay, but who's aware of it, right? What is now the identity? If you're not an identity in that dimension, what is the identity that's looking at that dimension? So you can experience the liberation from a dimension, and that's great. But that's not necessarily awakening. Awakening is that you become aware of the thing that is looking at the dimension. So to become aware of that is to actualize it. To, to become aware as it is to realize it. The waking up is is becoming aware as this consciousness that's aware of dimensions. The growing up is, is a process of moving through various dimensions. 
you're an identity just in a simplified form. It's like those Russian dolls or whatever, where it's you're, you know, you're an identity in, in a dimension and then you wake up to the next bigger dimension, right? Now you're looking at that smaller dimension. And then you wake up to yeah. a, the next bigger dimension. Now you're aware of those two dimensions. Then you wake up to the next dimension. Now you're aware of those three dimensions. And that it's that way with the chakras. It's like initially you are a first chakra. Then you wake up in the second chakra. And now you're aware of the first chakra. So you are a second chakra. You Initially you are your physical sensations. But then you wake up. Now you are emotions and you have physical sensations. Then you wake up to the third chakra. Now you are thoughts, but you have emotions and you have physical sensations. Then you wake up beyond that, and now you have thoughts instead of you are thoughts. That's the growing up. But that's still, that's all ego. That's all in the psyche. I think that's a good distinction. That's a good, that answers what I was trying to to differentiate. It's like growing up is dealing with the the personal content as you wake up to to what is looking at these things you're growing through it's tough i feel like we talk about these things a lot and we talk about actualization versus realization and it seems like each context of a different topic gives a different light to what what the dynamics of those differences are it's it's so hard to the the ego mind wants to, let me say it this way. It, it, if you're, if you're in a room, you're aware, okay, I'm, I'm in a certain room and, and then, but you can hear noises that are outside the room, right? Just accept that. Okay. That noise is, is originating outside this room. So maybe you can't, you can't see it. Right. Like right now, the room I'm in, I can there's construction going on in this in the street. And so I hear noises from from the construction, you know, or I hear a plane go fly over and I'm aware that, OK, that's that's a noise that's coming from outside this room. So I'm not looking around the room or sniffing around the room or, or reaching around the room to try to touch the thing that's causing the noise because I'm aware that it's it's actually occurring and originating outside the room I'm in. But it's like the ego mind doesn't want to accept that, you, even though people will conceptually concede to that. In, in the experience, the ego mind acts like, no, no, it's all within the ego mind's grasp. It's all within the ego mind's, you know, view. And waking up involves this experience that originates beyond the ego. And the ego can't see it. The ego is affected by it, but it's not the originator of it. I, I keep saying the same thing, but it, the we currently have a society where that you know the like it's the Nietzsche's God is dead thing. Like God's dead, the state's dead, religion's dead. Uh, respecting your parents is dead. And the origin, the source, you know, quote unquote, God to each of us is our own mind. We think that's, we think that's the all capable place. And so we have our own view of who we are. We have our own view of what God is or what, you know, someone might say I'm a Christian, but they have their own unique form of Christianity or their own unique form of Buddhism or whatever. And that and that's the thing that they are oriented to as the source of truth, the source of what matters. And it's a and it's an affront to someone's ego to suggest otherwise. But to to decenter your own ego mind, right? It leaves you it leaves you flailing and then and then you're you grasp for well what is the center right and so you either have an existential crisis right so the existentialism is this nothingness is the truth nothingness is the is the primary experience 
or you orient to some other thing and the big question, okay, what do you orient to? Do you orient to an idea? Do you orient to some other person? Obviously, I'm in the camp where ideally you would orient to consciousness. But if you orient to consciousness, meaning if, if you orient your ego attention to consciousness, then, then get ready to surrender because you're not going to be primary. You're not going to be in charge. You, you have to follow. You have to surrender as soon as you try to be primary, you actually then are losing touch with consciousness. What's the felt experience of that? Like shifting between wanting to be primary versus ceding authority to consciousness. It's, a, it's that thing where it's like the difference between sailing and having a motor. Like if you're sailing you you're aware that it's the wind that's that's providing the power and you're aware that you can't just go wherever you want directly you have to pay attention to well how's the wind blowing and then you have to tack right yeah yeah and so that that's this different mode than if you're in that same body of water and you say i'm going from here to there and you just you know you give the motor gas and you and you and and now you don't have to worry about the wind anymore you just you just power right through it right it's this very different mode our ego minds just want to be motors and power through which is a very different mode than following consciousness as the lead in general you know if i use that sailing analogy it's and, and then ideally you just ideally you would just go downwind all the time i guess like if you just really <laughs> obey, you know, if you just obey consciousness and go with consciousness, you're, you're going to have the experience of going downwind, me meaning you're not going to be fighting consciousness. However, it's going to involve a surrender to where your ego mind thought it should go. And then there's that, you know, that thing where if, if you really start obeying consciousness and follow its lead, it leads straight to death. <laughs> The experience the ego mind has is that it, it leads it right towards this experience of death. Is it, yeah. Is it a death you see coming? Is it? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you, you start sensing it right away. Hmm. And again, there's these layers and there's that rage against it. There's madness that happens. I was just thinking that the image in my mind is like you're sailing and like it's just towards this huge waterfall, but you just were so committed to sailing, you didn't even put a motor on the boat, so you can't even turn around. And then it's just the facing the fact that you're going to launch off this uh, waterfall on this sailboat. Yeah, yeah. It see, it seems from the ego point of view, it it, it looks like that. It, I mean, it just obviously our ego mind is set up to try to survive to try to be good, to try to have control, to try to be sane. And, and consciousness comes in and seems to just go exactly the opposite direction. And, it, and it's hard to convince someone that, that that's the correct direction to go. Mm. And how do, you, how do you go in that direction but not, not behave in some way that is terribly destructive? So would you say like the the potential like reactions to it are misinterpretations of the content because not because of not having a container for what that experience is? Yes, right, right. No doubt, and that's where religion, spirituality, etc., comes in to have a a container, to have a framework, to have a teaching where whereby one can understand the content of these experiences and not conflate them with 3D cognitive rational experience. I mean, it seems so obvious, you know, in concept, it seems so obvious. It's like, look, there's, <laughs> you know, there's imaginal experience that happens where you die and you're a beast and you're the devil and you're Jesus and you, it has all its phases and 
themes and archetypes and all that. And then, and it's like, yeah, but that's all, that's all different. That's going on within your psyche. But then there's just the physical, cognitive, rational, 3D, you know, linear space time. And it's like, okay, what's, what's the relationship between those two things, right? How do you just, you know, in the same way that these days there's virtual reality, right? We all know, we all have this idea of virtual reality, meaning it, it's, you know, it's a computer generated experience as though it was three dimensional space time, but it's not, it's, you're watching a TV or you're, you know, or you have uh, virtual reality glasses on or, or you're listening to a digital recording and it, and, you know, or you're looking at your iPhone and, and what's the difference between actual three dimensional experience versus virtual experience. And, and we have that going on in our own psyche. We have, we have kind of, you know, it's analogous to those, those two things. We can, we can go into our mind and have this experience, but, what's the relationship between that experience and then what's act, what are you actually going to outwardly behave or outwardly believe? And we, we conflate them. There's this uh, intermingling of the two. And it's like, what, you know, what, what is the true relationship between those things, right? How do you, how, how separate should you keep them? How much should you try to what inner experience should you go ahead and behave outwardly versus what should you just let it be inner? My understanding is that's where Freud, he said there's an unconscious, that was a big deal. And then another big deal was <laughs> the unconscious is crazy. The unconscious isn't this uh, nice, well-mannered thing, it's a beast. And then this question of what should you, what should you outwardly behave versus what should you just let happen inwardly is culturally dependent because we don't really know what correct or ideal way to behave is, but we're in constant conflict because whatever particular culture you live in, you have stuff going on in your psyche that doesn't match that. Mm. And then the, the a big barometer of, of mental health or emotional health or physical health is how are you dealing with that? How, you know, <laughs> what, what methods are you using to deal with the conflict between what's going on inside of you versus what you're allowed to behave? Are you, are you, uh, dealing with it by creating art? Are you dealing with it by somaticizing it? Are you dealing with it by projecting it? Are you dealing with it by talking about it? Are you dealing with it by just, uh, experiencing terrible shame are you dealing with it via fantasy? Are you dealing with it by watching movies about it? It's just, that's the, that's the human experience. Yeah. So you said, how are you dealing with the conflict between what's going on in your psyche versus what you're allowed to behave? Hmm. That's a really good framing of it, Lance. One way to deal with it is the dimension approach. <laughs> I feel bad that you're the one that always has to plug it while we're talking about it. So trying to <laughs> share the load. It's kind of the evil of movies is like giving the power to have those imaginal experiences over to characters outside ourselves and to like identify with that is, is seen as immature, but they've really just co-opted a narrative that was inside of people anyway. <laughs> All right. Just thinking about all that. I worked at Comic-Con here in the area a few weeks back. And so, you know, it's it's the whole convention around comics and stories and movies and people come dressed as their favorite characters from those things. And I think this, I think I appreciated the the artistry of it, but not the, the kind of psychological motivation uh -huh. to express in that way. Uh, yeah. And I think what you're talking about kind of, makes me a lot more empathetic to that or a lot more understanding of the, the want to physically and visually embody these stories that, that we identify with. <laughs> right. I think I've said before, but you know, just that idea of what, well, what, you know, what do you choose to dress up as, you know? And I, I have a, 
buddy who yeah. called me one time and, and was, <laughs> I think I said it even on this podcast where he, his son was Darth Vader. Did I tell you about that? I can't remember. He, uh, you know, he, he called me because, <laughs> cause I'm a therapist, right? So I'm supposed to like have, you know, know or have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, dude, my son, for like the eighth year in a row, since he was, you know, like five, now he's, yeah. you know, he, he's insisting on being Darth Vader for Halloween. And he's like, like, I don't know what to make of this. Yeah. Why? <laughs> you know, it's my, like, what does this say about him psychologically? You know, and, and should I let him be Darth Vader yet again? Or am I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Encouraging some latent perverse <laughs> desire to yeah. dominate a galaxy. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's such a tricky thing, you know, to this idea of let allowing the bad thing, allowing yourself to feel the bad thing. If you try to, anything you try to exclude, you're, you're excluding it from your consciousness, which means now you, you don't know it. It's no longer within you. It's now it's a mystery. Now it's objectified and now it's your enemy. And it's a, the big spiritual idea is that, and it's a false distinction. The truth is it's all in you. The whole drama, all the good guys, all the bad guys, they're all in you. Wrestling with them, organizing them is important, but, but you need to do it within you, which again is this, just to say the concept is easy, but. Right, right. But, but the concept is obviously not, our, our society does not operate that way. That is not the current cultural zeitgeist. But I think that tension you talk about, because, because it's not the current MO, that tension you talk about really resonates. That, that dealing with the conflict between what's going on in your psyche and what you're allowed to behave. And that, that struggle isn't, I don't think has been given enough context currently like in in our in our shared lived experience in this like you're saying in this cultural zeitgeist that we're in you can see the symptoms of that of that tension in yourself and in others and that there is you you can just like feel this grind between the two that people experience and like try to compensate for in some ways with a personality like as a personality is like trying to create this, this character that can be all the things that you think you should be without acknowledging the tension of what you're trying not to be. I like that. Cause it's just like, it's just this, uh, the motor. To, yeah. You're just, you've had some great analogies today. The idea of that using that motor to just drive forward. And it's almost like, you're just riding the motor. Like there isn't even a boat. Like it's just <laughs> as long as you're barreling ahead in the direction that you think you should, then you're not even worried about the fact that, that the water's right underneath you. Like the, there's just, yeah, that just the, if you can get enough people to look at your motor, like nobody's going to notice you don't have a boat. There's just something I'm trying to find the words for, but just this, bringing this idea of like, I feel like personality is a compensation in the context of these analogies. When you say Watt, Watt said ego is a futile chronic contra uh, muscular oh. contraction. Is that what he said? <laughs> yeah. He said uh, the ego is a futile chronic muscular tension. And it, and that, and that tension, the it's a, it's a compensation. Yes, Absolutely. I kind of I kind of liked how he said it just thinking about how I experienced like bringing awareness to something inevitably brings awareness to like an actual physical contraction in the body I, I, or I just for me that that's something that I've been like experiencing lately is that 
to actually be aware of like where I'm orienting from or inevitably I have to be more aware of like how my body is compensating to like, to drive that motor in the moment. Yeah. And that, that idea of shifting from even from like tacking to get in line with the wind to just going downwind is, is like the process of recognizing those physical compensations. Like there's a, there's a physical shift there in that uh, analogy or in the kind of the degrees of that analogy of sailing. That shift from like the way that, again, that especially I think in, in our current society that we're on the hook. We, we think we're on the hook to figure it out. We're on the hook to know what's what. And, and everyone acts like they do or, or like they're supposed to, or like they're, like they're actually going to achieve it. And obviously we have to make decisions, but, but the truth is we don't know, like even like with COVID, you don't know what's what you don't know exactly how this, what this virus is or how it operates or, you know, or abortion. It's like everyone acts like they know what the correct thing to do with abortion is. It's like, no, you don't. We don't even know what we're supposed to eat. (laughs) Right? Yeah. I was going to ask who you argued about COVID with recently. I tend to not, I just stay out of it. Okay. Okay. You know, in this thing where like, like with nutrition, everyone thinks they know what they're supposed to eat and, and they have these ideas and, and I don't understand, like after World War II, there was this huge shift with regard to diet, nutrition and, and, and the food industry in general. And the cereal companies took charge, made all kinds of money, and, and the correct diet became processed carbs. That was like the staple of the diet. And science and the media and culture was all about that. And that went on for you know roughly 50 years, and then it did a complete 180. And now the science is processed carbs are bad, and everyone just... Everyone just did an about face, and now that's correct. Now they're on board with what the media is telling them now. And, and it's just amazing to me that, that people think that, A, no one seems to be saying, well, what the fuck happened for the last 50 years? What was that all about? But, but it's, no, it's just, oh, no, just, I'll just switch. And now, now what I'm being told is true. Now I, I can trust the source. And it's like it's the same goddamn source that told you the wrong thing. But people, and then people will, you know, they'll argue with conviction that they're right. What they're really doing is arguing that whatever the fucking source that they're listening to, they're really saying that that source is right. They don't even really know what that source is. And again, like you got to make decisions about what you're going to eat. But the truth is you don't know. Are you drinking too much water or not enough water? I don't know. You getting too much protein, not enough protein, too much roughage, not enough. But yeah, so that's so there's a disconnection from body there too. Right, right. <laughs> the ideas become primary instead of the yeah. experience. I was I've been doing this uh some audio training at a church here and I'll go in and, and work with they have some volunteers, I'll go in and work with them uh once a week and kind of teach them some different things. So they're doing this uh broadcast every Sunday to uh to YouTube. And so they're they're trying to figure out how they want to to mix for broadcast. We're doing that, and there's one one guy. He's a he's an engineer. He's super, just great, really learning really fast, doing a great job. But we were working this last week, and he said he's trying to. It's like when you are doing anything with audio, you have kind of like meters, right? And the meters light up green, yellow, and red, and kind of indicates how loud something is. And if it goes too far into the red, it means it's clipping, which distorts the sound. So he's looking at all these meters he has. He's got a meter on his like mixer. He's got a meter on this TV for like what's going on this broadcast. And he's trying to make these meters line up. And he's worried about, about clipping. He's seeing like red sometimes. And 
I'm like, well, all of these meters are relative. So like, which one are you looking at? He's like, well, I'm trying to make them the same. I'm like, you can make them the same, but then they're still relative. They're not representing the same thing. They're just interpretations by those different things of the original audio. And so like, he's not really getting that. And then I'm like, I'm like, okay, let's like make it really loud and see what happens. Basically like two and three times as loud as it's ever been. And I'm showing him that at least visually, like it's not, it's not clipping. But then I'm like, why don't you listen to it? And I was like, when you listen to it, have you ever heard it distort? And he's like, no. I'm like, well, there you go. It's not clipping. If you listen to how it sounds, you can make it. Then that's the only way you really know if it's clipping because all of these meters, all of these measures for it are relative, but your ears are going to tell you what's actually happening. And you could have something wrong with your ears, but that wasn't the issue. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I, I had an experience not too long ago where I was, I was driving a car with the top down, and the my phone had said that it was going to be sunny all day. And as I'm driving, I see this storm cloud <laughs> moving in. And I was like, "That's not allowed to be there," you know. My phone yeah. said it's it's supposed to be sunny. Right. <laughs> oh, I've done. Yeah, it was just like telling the telling the weather that it's not supposed to happen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> done that for sure it wasn't going to be this hot today <laughs> right. it's only going to be 80 and it's 90 right now this isn't fair so to to admit that that we're not in charge of the weather it's it's the same with we're not in charge of <laughs> it's like the ego mind it shouldn't be in charge of self which sounds like not being responsible or not being, you know, growing up or whatever. But it's like we're really in the throes of experience and trying to navigate it versus, I mean, that's, you know, the idea is that that's more the truth. Obviously, this big push of positive thinking and, and uh, you know, that you're going to feel the way you think. And I, I just think it's a bad... It, it, there's a place for overriding what you feel and holding a certain thought and, you know, persevering and powering through and resisting and, and all that. But I think one needs to be aware when they're doing that and be aware that they are doing that. And that whole idea of that the rider needs to listen to the horse, it needs to be a relationship if you just run that thing into the ground because you're only paying attention to what the rider wants, you know, if the rider is the ego mind, you know, you're going to end up with an unhealthy horse. Our unconscious, our body, these various parts of our mind are the horse. We have to be in relationship to it. We have to listen to it. We have to ride it. We have to, we have to take care of it. We have to accept what it's doing whether we like it or not, whether it's in resonance with what we wish it was or not. Can't blame the horse. All right. Yeah, I like that too. Can you feel right now, it's like you can, you can just intentionally shift modes. Like if you just intend, okay, I'm going to take my ego mind off the hook right now and just listen to the horse. And, and whether that means listen to some other part of your mind or listen to your body or, you know, and it's like, okay, there's you, you, it's a different mode. You go into being more receptive in your cognitive mind. And it's like everything comes online. Yeah. Right. And it's not like I'm just instantly sailing away. <laughs> like it's not, I think that's where I wanted to say about like the, the tacking versus going downwind, but there's just, like you said, an awareness of, of all the things bodies like feeling or like other parts of self are feeling and experiencing that are being overridden by the motor. Yeah. And that, that flow, cause there's a flow of information, right? Yeah. And that flow, you, you feel how it's, there, there's uh, even even if it's uncomfortable, 
meaning if the if the information coming is painful or negative or something th- the very flow of it is sustaining the 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 empty terrible anxious state that the mind can be in is because it's disconnected from that flow mm. well it's like anxiety without a a cause if it's disconnected almost like there's so there's diff- different aspects to it that I'm feeling right now like there's one is just like you could feel it as fuel you could feel it as like the energy to do something but there's also like tensions there's also like contractions and it's like being disconnected from where that's coming from like could result in anxiety yeah i think that all those uh yeah just some really great analogies that you spelled out today i think they were really really helpful it, it's an interesting thing the the analogies like th- that as humans this idea of of the evolution of consciousness or, or humans, you know, evolving and that, you know, we went from riding on horses to now riding on machines and we went from sailing to, you know, having motorized boats. And now we have this, this computer generated virtual reality happening and it, and it's all like the analogies I don't think are by accident. You know what I mean? It's, I think it's, there's been this obvious. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Progression. The analogies are evolving. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a really cool, just fun concept. That the new analogies arise as humans evolve, as uh, consciousness evolves. And you've mentioned before it is the whole analogy of the internet and what that's made accessible, both practically and as an analogy for for consciousness. Right. If you want to learn more about the Dimension Approach, please visit dimensionapproach.com. 